Welcome everybody. Welcome to the final day of our webinar programme all about land and nature. The session you are here for is a beginner's guide to biodiversity and ecology and I'm sure that we will all be learning a lot in the next hour. Uh, as I think you probably know uh, throughout this whole week we've been doing um, an incredible range of webinars on different aspects of land and nature because it's timed to coincide with Churches Count on Nature. We've got churches all around the country. I had thought it was 300 and then I was updated yesterday that there's over 500 churches around the country who are taking part this week in Churches Count on Nature. They're going out into their churchyards and green spaces and they're recording the plants and the insects and the birds uh, that they find there. All of that information is going on to the National Biodiversity Network database and giving us lots more information about the ecology in our churchyards. And Time to fit in with that, we're doing our national webinar program. So quick bits of housekeeping. Uh, we'll be using the Q&A for questions rather than the chat. So if you move your mouse around, find the Q&A, that's where to put the questions. You can also see anyone else's questions and you can click the thumbs up next to ones that interest you. And at the end, when Godfrey has finished speaking, the time that we have left, we'll focus on those questions. We'll start at the top of the list and work our way down. After today, I'll be sending everyone who's registered the slides and any links from the chat and a link through to our feedback form. So please do take notes, but don't worry, the slides will follow. And I'm also recording the webinars and those will be up on our website in a few days time. Uh, trailers for upcoming attractions. This list has been getting shorter as the week has gone on. The remaining webinars this week, there's only one left after this one, which is our session on biological recording and the beautiful burial ground project. And this is particularly useful if you've been taking records in your churchyard, but you're not quite sure how to upload them, uh, because this will tell you what you need to know about how to do biological recording, what you, what you need to write down, where you put it in order to get that information into the system. And then on Saturday, Sheffield Diocese is hosting an Eco Church Festival online, to which all are welcomed, which is tied in with Churches Count on Nature. There's already 200 people signed up to that. I'm sure it's going to be a really good event. When I finished speaking, I'll put in the chat the link through to the webinars and to the Sheffield event. And then webinars on other topics we've got coming up. We've got three webinars on Eco Church coming up in June and July for wherever you are in your Eco Church journey. So the first one is on getting started, the second on working towards the awards and maintaining momentum, and the third on how it links with net zero carbon. And then we've got a very specific webinar for those of you interested in heat pumps in July. And then in September, one that I'm sure will be of interest to many of you on environmental fundraising. Where's the money going to come from for your projects? Uh, so there's the two halves of that, part one on the opportunities and part two on how to go about fundraising. Now onto the main event. Uh, you might well have met me if you've been along to one of our other webinars. Catherine Ross, I'm one of the staff who are behind the Church of England's Environment Programme and I'm based in the Cathedral and Church Buildings Division. But more importantly is our speaker, Godfrey Armitage. Godfrey is a very, very knowledgeable. Uh, he is the DEO for the Diocese of Coventry, He's taught ecology and conservation at Warwick University for several years, and he also tutors on the Christian Rural and Environmental Studies Certificate. So we're in very safe hands today for our beginner's guide to bio biodiversity and ecology. So let me stop sharing my slides and hand over to you, Godfrey, to share your screen and take us away. Right. Good morning or oh, good afternoon, actually. Um, can you hear me all right, uh, Catherine? I can hear you and your slides look perfect. So I think you're ready to go. OK, well, when I was asked to uh, suggest a title for this webinar, this one rolled off my tongue. For weeks, I was stuck wondering why I had suggested it. <clears throat> a beginner's guide sounded rather patronising and the order seemed to be the wrong way round. Ecology is the framework within which biodiversity exists. Even the days of creation reflect this. Three days for creating the stage, whether light, water, air and vegetation, and three days populating it with actors, whether sun and moon, fish and birds, and land animals, including man. Then I saw that this talk should reflect uh, my own personal odyssey, how I came to see the world and how I'm still a beginner 
still learning about it. It was through biodiversity that I came to appreciate ecology. And as the psalmist says, great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. I was born in Sri Lanka, what was then called Ceylon, soon after independence, and I spent my earliest years there. My father was a keen ornithologist, and he shared his love of birds with me. Here I was able to keep tropical fish, collecting specimens for my tanks in, uh, for my tanks in the local swamps. What a place to discover biodiversity. Then off to school, to England, to Latin, Greek, maths, chemistry, etc. But no classroom, classroom biology. And all that interest in biodiversity faded. After a year of chemistry at Oxford, my early interests resurfaced. And I was able to switch to read zoology, a course whose animal kingdom module was packed with the study of biodiversity both living and fossil. After graduating, my wife and I moved to Vancouver, where I worked on populations of char and trout. Some months on, after I had had a Damascus Road experience leading me to become a committed Christian, a thunderstorm on a mountain lake while setting gill nets there in an aluminium boat, together with a coincidence involving Psalm 97, gave me a fresh understanding of God's presence and power in his world. We're back to biodiversity. It's been described as the sum of all the different kinds of organisms inhabiting a region, whether the whole planet, an entire continent, an ocean, or our own backyards. Or more fully, as the variability among living organisms from all sources, including amongst others terrestrial, marine and other aquatic ecosystems, and the ecological complexes of which they are a part. This includes diversity within species, resulting from genetic biodiversity, between species and ecosystems. These specimens from my small collection of scallops demonstrate biodiversity. Scallops from the family Pectinidae contain over 300 species in 60 genera. They're often brightly colored shells with more or less unequal valves with eye spots and tentacles. Some species can swim. They're regarded as a delicacy. The UK species captured is Pecten maximus. Sustainable fisheries exist where they are captured by divers, but all too often they are trawled leading to great habitat loss and carbon dioxide release from damaged marine sediments. Pecton maximus is an example of a species of scallop. The starting point in any ecological investigation is the species. Organisms live together in populations of the same species, within communities of different species, interacting with one another and with their surroundings. A species can be defined as a group of organisms of common ancestry that resemble one another and which can interbreed with one another to produce fertile offspring. So not much use actually when we try to describe asexually reproducing species like amoeba, which do not interbreed or even more so with fossil species who have long forgotten how to breed. So here we must rely heavily on physical characteristics, including DNA and other circumstantial evidence. Most research has been done in high latitudes where estimates of species numbers are probably a fair reflection of reality. Many more species are present in the tropics, but as yet poorly sampled, and are most not identified or described yet. E.O. Wilson in 1993 estimated that there were 1.4 million species worldwide, mostly animals dominated by insects. Mora and his colleagues included many more marine species, so they estimated 8.7 plus or minus 1.3 million species. 
However, the most recent work by Larson and his colleagues has added huge numbers of bacteria and also many organisms that inhabit insect bodies, suggesting that there may be up to 2 billion species present on Earth, of which only about 1.4 million have actually been described and named so far. They're mainly large organisms as well. Larson and the team include the numerous groups of organisms that have not been simultaneously included in previous estimates, especially those often associated with particular insect host species. Our estimates suggest that they are likely to be at least one to six billion species on Earth, they write. Furthermore, in contrast to previous estimates, the new pie chart of life is dominated by bacteria approximately 70-90% to 90% of species. And insects are now only one of many diverse groups. Until the 18th century, it was generally assumed that the world was more or less unchanged since the creation, complicated by changes resulting from the fall. Partly due to the belief the earth was young, and partly due to a philosophical belief in the unchangeability of the essential essence of living organisms, reflecting ideas of, for example, Plato. But since then, it has become increasingly clear that the original creation took place billions of years ago, and the Earth's inhabitants have changed considerably during that time. These seed ferns from the Carboniferous era in Somerset are now extinct. From the fossil record, we know that 95 to 99% of all species that have ever lived are extinct, such as this Moroccan trilobite. The idea that nature is in a state of balance to which it will return when a disturbing influence is removed can no longer be uncritically accepted. Change can be short term or long term. This is a picture of Thingbetlia, the site of the original Icelandic parliament. Beyond the post-glacial lava fields, uh, it's colonized with birch and willow forest. And we can see Skjaldbere though, which is the source of the lava. And that erupted between 10,000, 1,000 years ago. So the forest isn't exactly large. You can see a few larger trees in the foreground. We're familiar with short-term ecological change. This process is known as succession. It can occur when a completely new habitat is formed, for example, following a lava flow. The, the lavas from Skjaldbre that are colonized with this forest, or skoga, as they say in Iceland. This is the result of initial colonization by lichens and mosses, followed by vascular plants. Succession is the continuing replacement of species and subsequent modification of the environment with time. In Iceland, this is a slow process, partly because of the climate, it's so cold. Even after two centuries, there are few vascular plants and the community here on the Lackey lava flow, which is uh, over two centuries old, is dominated by woolly hair moss. There are some dwarf birch and other small vascular plants. It takes many years for plants to colonize and 12 years after the Kraflafars ended in North Iceland, it was still very hot in places with no vegetation at all. There was negligible colonization as the propagules, the spores or seeds had a long way to blow in. And anyway, it was too hot to settle. It was steaming in places. And this is what each of us, uh, each of these rather, would have originally looked like. Something which many of you may be familiar with if you've been following the recent eruptions in southwest Iceland on YouTube. Succession can occur, for example, when abandoning farmland, which reverts through scrub to forest. This is what we see in rewilding, which is here at Nep, Nep Castle in Sussex. It results from modifications of the physical environment and population structure 
by the community and culminates in establishment of a biologically stable ecosystem and a climax community. In Mid-Sussex, the climax community is eventually oak forest. Disturbance of a climax community, for example, by clear felling a forest or by forest fire, results in a gradual return to the climax state. Species whose strategy involves rapid recolonization flourish first. Then those which can compete better. So for example, in British Columbia, as seedlings which tolerate low light levels like Western hemlock take over again from Douglas fir, these result in a new climax. So here we have uh, Western hemlock, the climax. Here's the disturbance. Here is the result of the disturbance there. And the shade produces uh, uh, conditions for Douglas, uh, from the Douglas fir, for the uh, Western hemlock to grow. So the shades tolerant seedlings of Western hemlock then can establish themselves on the broken logs of Douglas fir. But with longer term disturbance, such as climate change or the arrival of an invasive species, the community shows long term ecological change. Take, for example, the Lake Victoria story. During the late Pleistocene, starting about 130,000 years before present, desiccation of the lake occurred. It refilled after the ice last ice age ended about 14,600 years ago from adjacent draining, drainage systems. And during this period, founder species of fish arrived. This was followed by very fast speciation, resulting in between 500 and 1,000 endemic cichlid species <clears throat> involving, uh, sorry, evolving in Lake Victoria in the following 14,600 years. Most of these species are found nowhere else. This is what we call an adaptive radiation. So these are closely related sibling species of haplochromine cichlids from Lake Victoria. The females are almost identical to look at. You can see them both on the right-hand side of the pictures. The red males live deeper than the blue males. The females mate, uh, uh, mating choice is based on male coloration and that prevents interbreeding. These two closely related species maintain their distinctiveness as the red ones are still visible to females of their own species at depth, whereas the blue males are only visible to their females in the shallows. The two populations have become reproductively isolated and eventually no longer interbreed. However, in the last 60 years, since the introduction of huge Nile perch and the increase in agricultural runoff, which has caused pollution, uh, what we call eutrophication or nutrient enrichment of the lake, many of these species have become extinct. Likewise, man's influence extends to many other places since World War II, what with deforestation and the accidental introduction of the brown tree snake to the Pacific island of Guam, many species of ground and tree living birds have been eliminated by snakes. We live in a world in which Jesus said, not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. Our God suffers with the creation. During a visit to Guam for a family wedding in the course of a whole week, I saw only 14 individual birds, including these house sparrows. And the role of insect eating, eating birds has been taken over largely by huge spiders. So change occurs, species go extinct, and new species in time appear. At times in geological history, there have been periods of mass extinction caused, for example, by movement of continental plates or by significant climate change. But extinction usually occurs at a steady rate. For example, during the Cretaceous times, between about 165 million years ago, when chalk was being laid down in the Seven Sisters chalk cliffs of Sussex, with England as far south as the Bahamas. 
this chalk was laid down in the shallow parts of the Tethys Sea. Ocean currents went right round the equator. Sea levels were 200 metres higher than present. Here in Coventry, we'd be underwater with that. Carbon dioxide levels were very high. The average temperature was six degrees centigrade higher than present. And there was no ice on planet Earth. It was a long, stable period. This was followed by what we call the Cretaceous Tertiary Extinction. As Britain drifted northwards, the Tethys Sea closed and the equatorial currents, which had kept temperatures high, were ended by the Indian land mass, mass pushing northwards into Asia and Central America, closing the gap between North and South America. New volcanic activity and a massive meteorite meteorite strike in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico led to huge loss and replacement of species. But these extinctions were small compared to the earlier Permian-Triassic extinction when the supercontinent Pangaea broke up. Currently, many scientists believe the activities of humans are causing the sixth great extinction. Increasing numbers of scientists describe this as the Anthropocene. Since the end of the last ice age, about 11.7 million years ago, and until recently, the average lifetime of a vertebrate species appears normally to have been one to two million years. However, the rate of loss of vertebrates over the last 100 years is between 100 to 1,000 times normal. And there has been a massive change in the type of variety and uh, species. Well, 10,000 years ago, we and our domesticated mammals made up about 1% of the global mammal biomass. We now make up 96% of the biomass. That remaining 4% is all the wild mammal species we value across the earth. Just because a small a population remains, this does not mean it's out of danger. Cheetahs, for example, suffer from low population size and limited genetic biodiversity. This means that should environmental conditions change greatly, they may no longer have the capacity to adapt to the new conditions. So what has caused this biodiversity loss? HIPPO is a useful acronym. Habitat loss, invasive species, pollution, population increase, over-harvesting. Population increase is the driver as we march on towards 10 billion human inhabitants. But pollution in terms of overproduction of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrogen oxides and refrigerant gases, results in perhaps the most rapidly growing and significant threat to the living world. All these are the things that we study when we study the ecology of organisms and their environment. The science of ecology aims to understand what controls how much of what lives where. Here in the background, we see a thrush anvil, a drain cover on which a thrush has smashed its prey. These banded snails show their genetic variability, varying for camouflage from pure pink in the nearby beechwood where the thrushes collected them, to chocolate banded in grassland. Less well camouflaged individuals are more likely to be found and eaten. For 30 years as a biology teacher, I would try to share my love of ecology using such local examples. So ecology is defined as the science that studies the relationship between living things and their environment, or as the scientific study of the interactions that determine the distribution and abundance of organisms. A system implies an organization of things that are linked together. The ecosystem was regarded by ecologists in a survey by the British Ecological Society in 1989 as the most important concept in ecology. 
The ecosystem is the fundamental unit that includes all the organisms in a given area or community. Interacting with their physical environment so that a flow of energy leads to a clearly defined trophic or feeding structure. To biodiversity and to material cycles within the system. For example, my mini pond. Light energy enters. Heat energy of respiration is lost from our organisms. Nutrients enter in the form of carbon dioxide, dust and dead leaves. And loss of nutrients occurs during the occasional cleaning, removal of dead leaves, or when adult insects emerge and leave. But mostly the nutrients recycle within the pond. Within ecosystems, organisms are part of food chains. You are no doubt familiar with the school example, grass, rabbit, fox. Here on the tundra high ground on the Snyfels Nest Peninsula, where I nearly trod on this camouflaged ptarmigan, we see it feeds amongst other things, sorry, it feeds on other things, uh, on dwarf willow and gyre falcons feed on it. More links can be put in to show food webs. For example, in the Greenland lemming feed on willow, sink foil and mountain avens. Stoat feed on them. And when lemming numbers explode, other predators join in. They switch to feed on them. This flow of food in an ecosystem can be shown diagrammatically. This is a diagram first published by Kenneth Mann in 1967. Energy flows through, through the system, whereas nutrients cycle. The yellow shows the energy and the brown shows the nutrients. So here we see the energy recycling and increasingly we're realizing the importance of the decomposer community in recycling, for example, as a carbon store in the soil. If we take one particular nutrient, the nitrogen cycle, the nitrogen cycle is essentially for the essential for the growth of plants and for sustaining of food chains. Huge amounts of nitrogen have been fixed industrially since Fritz Haber's uh, process used to make fertilizers and of course explosives started in the First World War. This has contributed to a phenomenal increase in agricultural output but also to eutrophication, to enrichment of aquatic ecosystems and loss of biodiversity. Nitrogen is also fixed by root nodules. So bacteria, whether free living in the soil or in root nodules of alder trees and bean family plants, fix the nitrogen extremely efficiently. The nitrogen cycle is essential for the growth of plants and sustaining of food chains. Carbon is present in the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. Huge reservoirs of carbon compounds exist in organisms, in the soil and aquatic sediments and in fossil fuels. Currently, there is an imbalance because more carbon dioxide is being returned to the atmosphere than is being removed from it. Infrared radiation reflected from the Earth's surface and clouds is absorbed at particular wavelengths by various molecules, causing them to vibrate and heat up. Asymmetric molecules like water vapor, carbon dioxide and methane. Carbon dioxide is regarded as a greenhouse gas. Is carbon dioxide a friend or foe? Greenhouse gases like water vapor, carbon dioxide and methane give planet Earth a pleasant climate. Without any of them, the temperature of the Earth's surface would average minus 18 degrees centigrade. But if CO2 rises year on year, it absorbs more heat and global temperatures rise. When I started teaching in 1973, carbon dioxide levels were 333 parts per million. It's now up to 420 parts per million as of May 2021.
Carbon dioxide levels are at a record high for historical times. We call this curve here the Keeling curve. But if the carbon dioxide rises year on year, it absorbs more heat. Global atmospheric temperatures rise. We've known about this phenomenon really since the 19th century and progressively have understood more and more about it since then. This graph shows how global atmospheric temperatures are rising. We're very likely to miss our Paris target of limiting rises to plus 1.5 degrees centigrade. Hence the importance of the current G7 talks in Cornwall and the forthcoming COP26 meeting in Glasgow. And the problem is that we live in a take, make, waste economy. We extract millions of tonnes of fossil carbon for fuel, for steel and for cement manufacture as we upgrade to the latest model and discard so much as waste. We need to move from a linear economy to a circular economy. Look at the four arrows on the circular economy. We need to maintain things for longer, to reuse or redistribute them, to refurbish or remanufacture or recycle when the parts become no longer able to be used. In addition, we waste 3.6 million tonnes of food per annum, the highest amount in Europe, while 8.4 million people, according to Fair Share, struggle in the UK to afford to eat. So here we need to cut waste, buy what we need, get less scared of best before dates, compost rather than bin and buy local. We must reduce resource remand, uh, demand, reduce pollution, produce less carbon dioxide, create less eutrophication. We've talked about nutrient cycling. How does energy flow in ecosystems? Predators may be as small as centipedes or as large as buzzards. The English ecologist Charles Elton, known as the father of animal ecology, first noticed these patterns while doing research 100 years ago in Spitsbergen. Smaller numbers, fewer predators, but large. Small individuals, large numbers, and many small predators. This is described as a pyramid of numbers. If we instead classify organisms according to the type of food they eat and put the numbers in each level, whether herbivores, predators, or higher level predators, we also end up with pyramids. So here we have what we call trophic or feeding levels. First level is producers, green plants, uh, herbivores, which eat them, predators, which eat them, and then top predators. However, the shape may vary. For example, if we count the number of organisms on an oak tree, the pyramid looks rather different. The oak tree happens to be rather large. And if we take it as one organism, then we may have 130,000 or so aphids and other sorts of other uh, small herbivores on that. And uh, this can then be uh, converted to, um, to mass. This represents the photosynthetic green leaves at the bottom, leaf eating insects, insect eating birds, and perhaps a sparrowhawk as a carnivorous consumer. Because energy is lost to each level through respiration, which maintains the organisms, less is available for your level above. So the mass or biomass of organisms in the higher levels is usually less. However, this is complicated by the fact that larger organisms live longer and so accumulate mass. So, for example, pyramids of biomass in the English Channel show that you've got a large biomass of the long-lived animal plankton or zooplankton, and a smaller biomass of the short-lived plant plankton or phytoplankton. So ecologists started instead to estimate the amount of energy flowing through each feeding level over the course of a whole year. And from that, we end up with information like this. The energy that's assimilated representing 100%, of that, only 10% is actually available to a predator in the next level. That's the stuff that's used by an animal to make eggs and fetuses, to replace tissues, new tissue for growth, muscles, etc., storage products. 
But 90% of the energy taken in is lost in maintenance. It's not available to the higher trophic levels. So if we look at a cow, 90% of the vegetal matter eaten by a herbivore, the cow, is unavailable to us. And then if you take into account the bones, the offal, the skin, an even smaller percent is available as meat. This is part of the argument that she, we should cut down on meat eating. That there is less energy available. Perhaps if we had more plant material, we ate more plant material, there'd be more available for everyone. However, we do not eat grass ourselves, so herbivores can convert plant material that's unavailable to us to valuable food. Also, meadow grazed animal can be used to increase carbon dioxide uptake by soils and increase biodiversity when used in conservation grazing. Rob Havard provides an excellent example of how to do this in his regenerative mob grazing. Sixty years ago, ecologists Hairston, Smith and Slobodkin wondered why is the world green? Well, usually green. If you go to the deserts, it isn't. The tundra, it, uh, rather the, uh, the, the mountain tops and uh, Antarctica, it isn't. But in most, in most uh, communities, the, the world appears to be green. In autumn, the ground is then covered in fallen leaves. These leaves haven't all been eaten by herbivores. So the herbivores don't actually wipe out the uh, lower level. For example, in this lake, Daphne or water fleas were kept in check by predatory midge larvae or Chaobrus. So microscopic green phytoplankton flourished. I sampled this lake, Eunice Lake in 1969 and worked on the trout population in nearby Loon Lake, uh, 1970 to 72. And this provided the source of trout that were introduced to Eunice Lake in 1975. As the trout increased, the predatory Chaobrus phantom midge larvae decreased. So the Daphnia water fleas increased and the phytoplankton plant algae decreased, what we call a trophic or feeding cascade. We see similar effects in Yellowstone National Park, a USA. Elimination of wolves in the mid 20th century led to population increases of herbivores and overgrazing, particularly by elk. Reintroduction of wolves in the 1990s led to falls in the elk population. And they also moved away from areas around rivers, leading to regrowth of aspen trees. As the elk moved away, Bigger beaver colonies uh, flourished with all these new, new trees. Beaver dams re-established pool and riffle systems in the rivers, increasing the cutthroat trout population. Home range is the region that encompasses all the resources that an animal requires to survive and reproduce. The smaller an ecosystem is, the less likely it is to support predators. What does this tell us about planning a nature reserve? How large should it be? What, it is, what does it tell us about the small patchworks of intact forests left in the Amazon basin after clear felling? Many species living there may already be effectively extinct, though they don't know it yet. In the jungles of Venezuela, one finds full suites of herbivores, including howler monkeys, and of predators, including jaguars. Lago Guri, this lake, was formed in 1969 by damming a river in a mountainous region of Venezuela. So it contains islands of various sizes. Small ones, colored brown here, lack predators and were stripped bare by herbivores. Large islands provided sufficient home range for predators. In drought, the lake levels fell. Predators swam to the newly enlarged islands and recolonized. The herbivores decreased and vegetation reformed. However, when the lake levels rose again, the islands decreased in size 
And so they became uh, uh, rid of vegetation again. So if nature reserves are too small, they will not support ecological communities that would have lived previously in, in intact larger areas in that region. This brings us to the idea of conservation. Preservation implies keeping something, a species, a landscape, a habitat in as unchanged form as possible. Whereas conservation is an active process which can be defined as the planned management of natural resources. For example, the mowing re regime in country churchyards and provision of shelters, for example, mats for slow worms, legless lizards, here in the churchyard at St. Mary's Old Barrow in West Warwickshire. Reservation ecology involves setting aside land, protecting it from human use and allowing biodiversity to flourish. Large reserves may be essential for large or migratory species and management may be easier if entire watersheds are contained in a reserve. Edge effects become more important the smaller the reserve. For example, nesting success increases for forest interior birds the further they are from a forest edge. But a small reserve means that they will be less likely to get far away from the edge. The larger the area of your churchyard and are set aside for wildlife, the greater is its potential biodiversity. The closer your churchyard is to land or churchyards that are biodiverse, the easier it is to maintain a population which can recolonize after local extinctions. These patchworks are the result of deforestation, urbanization, or monoculture farming practices involving, involving huge fields with little remaining woodland. Note the importance of corridors, like hedgerows for allowing populations to keep intact. Restoration ecology is also a familiar concept where land has been turned into nature reserves, particularly after quarrying, extraction of minerals or gravel and industrial purposes returning it, if possible, to its former state. In this case, Wolf Fields in Southall, which is a neglected wasteland. Sorry, I've just slid on. There we are. Wolf Fields, a neglected wasteland used only for rubbish dumping, drug taking and substance abuse, was acquired by Russia in 2012. Work started in 2013 and uh, initially the site was cleared of 54 tonnes of rubbish. Nest boxes and bird feeding stations were some of the first improvements to attract wildlife. Reconciliation ecology is a term introduced by US biologist Michael Rosenzweig, where modified environments are created that benefit both wildlife and humans. Here, synanthropic species are species which adapt to urban landscapes found in cities worldwide, for example, house sparrows, brown rats, and red fox. Many suburban areas are occupied by native species. These organisms become suburban adapters, living in areas where, with biodiversity greater than the surrounding landscape due to richly cultivated gardens. Conservationists have an obvious role in the restoration and management of large rural reserves but also have an important part to play in restoring and maintaining elements of biodiversity in cities and churchyards. And this is where urban churchyards can play a part. I was able to complete my career teaching ecology at university level. I can hardly classify myself as a scientist, just a teacher, but I found great joy in God's word and in his work. And in both spheres, I still find myself to be a beginner. It was one of my greatest pleasures to be involved in setting up the programme for our 2015 conference at Coventry Cathedral to gather get together speakers to present stories of hope in a time of environmental crisis. Dave Bookless wrote in 2015, a biblical perspective emphasises that both human and non-human creatures are made for the glory of God and have value directly in relation to God. This has significant implications for Christian attitudes to biodiversity conservation and for the conservation movement. 
As we study ecology, which aims to understand what controls how much of what lives where, we can say with the psalmist, great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. And I've just left some suggestions here, which will be uh, on, the, on the slides that come through to you. So do have a look at these. I particularly think Simonson's a good place to start. Um, it's a short paper. And a Berry, a Sam Berry, Professor Sam Berry, uh, wrote the most brilliant book, uh, Bringing Together Christian and Ecological Ideas. So um, also getting involved with these organisms is, uh, org organizations is a good way to uh, get uh, involved within, uh, with ecology. Wow. I'm slightly blown away by that. There was so much new information and so beautifully explained. My head is, my head is full. Um, we have got about a quarter of an hour for questions. So please, if you're left with a question, or maybe even a reflection um, after that amazing talk, please do find the Q&A and pop it in there. Uh, and if you see other people's questions and you're interested, put a thumb up next to those and those, those questions will go to the top. Uh, Godfrey, we've got a question from Jenny. What would you say to people who argue that changing farming practices to be more sustainable will mean that people aren't fed because we don't produce enough food? Okay, um, one of the problems we have with our food production in this country is that we are wasting probably 40% of the food we produce. So actually, if we took that into account, we could probably afford to uh, make our farming much more sustainable. And uh, we also do uh, tend to go for very cheap bulk food with lots of buy one, get one free offers to try and stimulate movement by the supermarkets. So uh, I think it requires people to make an active decision to decide uh, to buy uh, either organic food or um, less meat and uh, more expensive cuts. And, we always check to see whether it's it's locally grown, it's organic, uh, animal friendly as well, and uh, if possible, fair trade. Loaf, I think that's a really important uh, consideration. But uh, I think if we tend to go for more uh, plant material and be much more uh, circumspect in the sort of meat that we buy and fish, we have to look very carefully at what we are buying, then I think we might uh, see that we can get some sort of balance there. Um, thank you. The next question is from Sharon. Could you say more about your views on the role of trees and hedgerows, etc.? Is tree planting a sensible focal point? Well, uh, as someone who gorilla gardens and uh, pops uh, oak trees and things from my garden or where they're growing where they shouldn't into uh, nearby land. Uh, I'm very in, much in favour of planting trees because uh, they do in fact incorporate an awful lot of carbon. However, huge monoculture uh, tree plantations are not helpful. The worst examples were perhaps in Caithness where, uh, and, and Sutherland where huge amounts of bog, peat bog was drained and, uh, and trees planted. Uh, nearly all for commercial harvesting. But in fact, uh, the loss of carbon from the drained peat bogs far offset the, uh, the, the carbon that was fixed by photosynthesis. So uh, you've got to be careful what you do. And also you can't just plant uh, a whole series of trees. You need to be thinking in terms of uh, uh, building up an ecological community. So uh, you need to make sure you have mixed species and allow those to grow and to ensure that you get proper uh, shrub and uh, herb layers uh, developing. Because tree planting is only one of a range of nature-based solutions, isn't it? If we want to absorb carbon, there's, there's tree planting or the soil improvement and regenerative agriculture. Like there's a whole spectrum and people tend to think only of tree planting, I think. Yes. Um, there is a strong move towards no-till or min-till, minimum tilling uh, in many parts of the country now. And uh, I think this is really important. Uh, it started with one particular farm in Norfolk who uh, had, to, had to stop uh, plowing his fields one autumn 
because uh, there was a dust storm over the, local, the, the nearby A road and the police said, come on, stop, stop doing that. Um, so he thought this is crazy. So he sold all his plying gear and started to get um, new equipment so he could uh, pop this stuff in without tilling. Well, of course, the local farmers, uh, his neighbours, thought he was crazy, uh, especially as over the next few years, black grass and various other pests uh, really increased. But then after about five years, he discovered that uh, things were growing much better. He was not losing his soil as he had been doing so. Water levels were better, the carbon in the soil were better, and his productivity was going up. We have to take the long view. Question from Jenny. What do you think about carbon offsetting schemes, particularly when used to offset carbon that would be really hard to reduce or remove? I think in this context, I'm presuming she's talking about nature based carbon offsetting schemes rather than solar panels. Or yeah, I, I think there are several types of carbon offsetting schemes, and I'll mention uh, another one uh, which I think is important as well. Um, uh, obviously, if we are investing into no-till and regenerative agriculture and things like that, I think these are really valuable. In fact, some of the reported uh, in increases in carbon uh, compounds in, 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 people, uh, in people's uh, pastures, meadows, uh, done by people like Rob Havard, who I've mentioned, a speaker at our 2015 conference, uh, that there have been real improvements in soil quality. In fact, he, he overwinters his cattle now on the meadows um, because the, so the, the plant material is so abundant and actually nutritious. So he's not bringing in uh, feeds, uh, feedstock materials from elsewhere. Um, so that's one particular thing. I think carbon offsetting there is important. Of course, climate stewards are doing this not just in this country, they're going to places where there's very rapid growth and uptake of carbon dioxide and encouraging, for example, in Ghana and other parts of Africa and in Mexico, planting. And this is uh, re-establishing uh, re canopy layers of trees under which local farmers can then grow uh, their crops much more effectively. Drought is, is much, much less uh, 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 a problem there. Um, the Boy Who Harnessed the Wind, a recent BBC film that some of you may have seen on, was, was very good actually by showing how, uh, by stopping cutting down trees and by, by uh, uh, using uh, pumps, pumped water, which the, the, the young lad had managed to do. I thought that was an excellent film. But going back to carbon offsetting, there are other schemes which we'd known about for some time. Uh, people had known that crushed basalt uh, mine spoil, uh, absorbs carbon dioxide very quickly, uh, silicates absorb carbon dioxide to turn to carbonates. And we see this, for example, in Iceland, uh, at one kilometre square that I used to go and do research on with uh, uh, some of the, the, the school uh, pupils that uh, I worked with in Iceland. Uh, we, we were looking at um, the, the materials coming off uh, fairly recent lava flows and um, there you find that there are rapid changes in the minerals uh, present uh, as, as carbon dioxide is taken up. And this is being done now uh, in Iceland uh, as a commercial process where they inject uh, carbon dioxide into, um, into the lava. Um, so I think that's, that's a really important new, new way of doing this. Um, I think I probably covered that. The next question is a really interesting one from Charles that says, as it's taken so long for people to engage with climate change, how best can people more quickly engage with biodiversity? I would think the first thing to do is to join your local wildlife trust, uh, also to get involved with Arosha uh, through its programmes, uh, A Wild Christian. Um, and also to get a few books. Um, I've given a couple of references on that final slide, which included uh, the Field Studies Council, and they have some wonderful uh, laminated uh, identi uh, identification guides. Um, they're not fully comprehensive. Uh, they're much more designed for beginners, but they're really worth, worth getting. And uh, you can take them out in the rain and uh, study things like grasslands, chalk grasslands, acid grasslands, 
Uh, you can look at uh, lichens in churchyards, um, etc. So really worth doing that. And uh, I think it's important to get together with other people, but uh, do walk through your local nearest woodland and just spend a bit of time looking around you. Uh, that's really the start. I think those are incredibly useful points pointers for people who've who've got the who understand the importance. My guess is from Charles's question that he's meaning more how do we get how do we get a much broader understanding? How do we get across the importance of the crisis for nature in the same way people are starting to understand the crisis for the climate? Uh, I'm not expecting you to have any easy answer to that, Godfrey, but do you have any reflections on it? Sorry, could you just repeat that? How do we, I think what Charles is meaning is how do we get a much wider understanding in the population about the crisis for nature and how urgent it is? Uh, and I just wondered if you had any reflections on that. How do we, how do we get everyone to care? I think uh, all these things start with individuals. I think you have to have passion yourself. If you don't have that, uh, it's academic. And uh, it's really important that we start to uh, get involved personally because unless we do that, um, what, why would other people be interested? I think what uh, Andy was saying, Andy Lester yesterday in his, his talk on the Eco Church talk yesterday about a child who was uh, playing a game where he was uh, looking at animals, uh, hypothetical animals on his, on his screen with other things around him and not taking any interest in them. I think that's really uh, important to realize that you have to see and appreciate these things. And I think the other area is that we have to ensure that our youngsters, primary school children, and even preschool really start to walk the woods and walk the local areas uh, with uh, an appreciative parent or other adult who is gonna show them what's there. So we've got to learn ourselves. The next question is from Catherine, who says, in Essex Woodlands, wildlife trusts are coppicing many mature trees to promote other wildlife. It's painful to see beautiful mature trees coming down and taken out of the woodland, but new life is appearing. Bluebells, lily of the valley, etc. Do you support this approach? Well, I would say that uh, change like that is actually echoing what happens in wildlife, any, in nature anyway, that uh, you have accidents, trees fall down, you create gaps, etc. And coppicing is a very ancient uh, way that we've, uh, has been used in this country for millennia, uh, well, I wouldn't say millennia, centuries, uh, where uh, particularly hazel and uh, sweet chestnut have been cut down to ground level and they regenerate within uh, a year or two, and you get really far, uh, quite quite strong, uh, straight uh, trunks coming up from the, the base. Uh, you get a lot of this, and you do increase biodiversity. And what you find is that coppice and standards gives you a really biodiverse habitat. Now, this isn't ancient woodland. Uh, there are a few semi-ancient natural woodlands left in this country, but not many. But uh, this sort of biodiversity allows us to maximise or rather this treatment allows us to maximize biodiversity. However, if you were uh, some sort of uh, sh shy, deep woodland creature, perhaps, um, now I'm speaking off the top of my head here, wryneck or some other little bird, uh, tree creepers, maybe you might not be so happy of having all these, uh, this, this diverse uh, woodland. But in fact, what you're finding is that many species come in and colonize um, for example, um, local woods near us, Wrighton Woods, have been coppiced and also they've cut um, scallops into the, the rides that go through the woodland and those fill up rapidly with uh, new herbs and then huge numbers of moths and butterflies. So uh, this then, of course, is lost after 10 or 20 years because the, the woodland starts to regenerate really quite quickly. Uh, now we've only got a minute left, so it's going to have to be very, very quick answers to the last two questions and then we'll come to a close. The first is, has Godfrey written a book? No, but I just revised a module for the Christian Rural and Environmental Studies uh, uh, programme. Uh, it's a certificate programme. It's an uh, organisation run by John Ray Initiative and uh, 
it's I think I, I I've based the talk today on quite a lot of the ideas from that uh, module, but uh, I have no intention of writing a book. Um, is the concept of ecosystem services helpful? Uh, yes, to a certain extent, but um, it's very hard to value things like uh, spiritual services, the cultural services. How can you put monetary values on these things? Um, so it's a very limited system. Right, it's one o'clock. Uh, thank you so much, Godfrey. You, you hold so much information, so much understanding, and you've explained it really clearly. And thank you very much. Um, and thank you to everyone who has joined us here today. Uh, we've got one more webinar left in this series at four o'clock today about biological recording and the Beautiful Burial Ground Project. So I hope to see some of you there or at the Sheffield Eco Church Festival on Saturday. Uh, I will send you an email this afternoon with Godfrey's slides and with those links from the chat. Uh, and I hope that you do find them helpful in thinking about how to increase um, look after nature in your churchyard or other green spaces around you. Thank you very much for joining us today. Could I just add, um, Catherine, that um, I will send some notes which are basically my script, uh, uh, otherwise the slides, some of them might not make much sense. They probably won't make much sense even with the notes, but there you go. Thank you very Thank much you. for sharing that with everyone. Bye. Bye then.